Thank you for your attendance this morning. And is there anywhere in the world that has a better view as you look out the window and see the uh, gorgeous mist on the Wisconsin River? Really like to thank this morning. My name is Craig Tim. It's always my pleasure to be here with you. Again, and thank the Chamber, part of Wisconsin Chamber, for having usually two a year. We usually have a fall legislative breakfast and a spring one, depending upon the year and what's going on. And, and as you know, usually there's nothing going on politically anywhere in the world. So, but uh, that's going to pick up again. We especially like to thank this morning Enbridge. Do we have any representatives from Enbridge here? We thank them as a major sponsor. And Payroll and Bookkeeping LLC, anyone from that organization? Again, those are our two sponsors and we thank them very much. Before we begin, if you would stand, if you would join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much. We're going to take a little different uh, direction today. We are, um, we are down one um, representative. Scott Krug sends his regrets. He was not able to join us this morning. But we are very pleased to have Nancy Vandermeer, State Representative, and State Senator Patrick uh, Teston. Um, Patrick's been in the news a little bit <laughs> in the last couple of weeks. But what we'd like to do is we'd start off and give each of our elected officials a chance to kind of update some of the things they're working on. I think we all know their backgrounds, but uh, if we have any new folks, maybe a little bit on kind of their journey to the legislature. And then uh, I have a series of questions, but also want to make it very uh, informal. We'll try, we'll like to have some discussions. I especially feel safe this morning. There's no place where we have this many uh, folks in uniform. So thank you for all that you do every, every day to keep us safe. And we appreciate that. So Nancy, would you like to start us off and give us kind of a little, actually you can stay there if you're comfortable or whichever you whichever you'd like. We'll do like a panel discussion. We'll do a panel discussion. Okay, thank you. Well, good morning, everyone. I'm State Representative Nancy Vandermeer, and I represent the 70th District. And for many of you, you are probably familiar with the geographic area that it covers. It's northern Monroe County, including Toma, Sparta, a corner of Jackson County, a large part of Wood County, and then a corner of Portage. And I was elected in 2014. I am currently the chairperson of Rural Development Committee in the Assembly, and I am also vice chair of the Committee on Veterans and Military Affairs. And uh, just a little background on me personally, I was an automobile dealer, I was a General Motors dealer. My parents uh, served in that capacity prior to me, and that business was in Toma. So I was also very active in our community and, and try to continue to be. And uh, at any rate, I have served on my hospital board, school to work program, some chamber board, like many of you do. And this has really helped me in a lot of the work that I was able to accomplish and still do in the assembly. My husband is a fifth generation dairy farmer, so that gives me an opportunity to have some additional insight. And by the way, um, on the 12th, it was National Farmer Day, so uh, make sure if you didn't say thanks to one of your local farmers, please do so. And uh, so at any rate, I had a, a very productive legislation session so far, and many of my areas include the, the um, topics that I discussed, of course. I've um, we had some, I'm also on the health committee, and I had a number of uh, uh, bills that went through in that particular area. I have also authored uh, a couple of pieces of legislation relating to agriculture as well. So perhaps some of those items will come up, of course, in our questions too. So I'll leave further details out because it looks like Senator Teston is anxious <laughs> to share some information with him. 
So thanks for joining us this morning. It's always good to see you. And you know, I, I um, we were just talking a few minutes ago about the beautiful view here. This is just a gem every time I come. It's uh, such a, a wonderful setting to have this meeting to get together with. So, so good morning once again. Well, thank you, Nancy. And it's great to see everyone and great to be here and uh, uh, be a part of another great legislative breakfast here at the chamber. So uh, State Senator Patrick Teston represent the 24th Senate District, which encompasses all of Portage County, a large portion of Wood, and then portions of Jackson, Adams, uh, Washera, and uh, Monroe County. And so uh, just started my second term this past January. I was reelected last November. I want to thank everyone for their support. There was a, a time there where we thought this race was going to be super close. And uh, thankfully, uh, thanks to our hard work and your support, we came back with a nearly 13 point uh, victory uh, last November. Uh, so I chaired the Senate Health Committee. This back in January, I was also elected as the um, Senate President Pro Tem, so I serve in a leadership position within the state Senate. And it's been a, a very fun session to this point. There's a lot of challenges in front of us, but a lot of opportunities as well. And one of the things that I'm most thankful for was the state budget that we actually um, had bipartisan support for. It was the first time since 2007 that we had a bipartisan budget where both Republicans and Democrats in both chambers um, supported the, the budget that we had passed. And it was a, a much different document than the one that was introduced earlier in the year. We took a budget that was introduced by Governor Evers that would have increased taxes by over a billion dollars and instead provided historic tax cuts while still making critical investments in key areas, whether it was K-12 education, um, our infrastructure, as well as our health care. Uh, on the education side alone, for the first time in years, we have matched the state's commitment to fund K-12 education by two-thirds. And we had record investments going back to our local road aids program so our local communities can get the support resources that they need. And then also making sure that our, our health care workers and our health care system have the resources they need as we continue to deal with um, the lingering impacts of COVID-19. So while there are still challenges ahead of us, I'm proud of what we've been able to accomplish to this point. And I want to thank all of our stakeholders and partners here for all the work that you do as uh, we try and get the state back on the right track. Thank you both. Appreciate that update. Nancy, we're gonna start. You are vice chair of the Assembly Committee on Veterans and Military Affairs, and we spent a lot of news about um, things going on at Fort McCoy, the uh, refugee situation. Is there anything you could share with us this morning? Any, any update? Thank you once again. Um, just to give you a little background, you know, when I talked about that my husband is a dairy farmer, you're probably wondering what is she talking about now? But the reason why I bring this up is I live right next door to Fort McCoy. The dairy farm has been there for 150 years. And for a good share of that time, Fort McCoy has been an excellent partner. And so I want to just, number one, give you a, a little bit of a context about Fort McCoy. How many of you are, are familiar with Fort McCoy? Very good. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, Fort McCoy is an Army Reserve base and installation here in Wisconsin, of course. Um, it is comprised of 60,000 acres. It is also adjacent to another 60,000 acres for the Department of Interior. And the reason why I'm giving you a little background on this is just to put it into context, the type of scope that is available at Fort McCoy. And of course, in the center of that is the cantonment area, so to speak, like a, a village where there are barracks, accommodations, um, training centers, um, and a lot of improvements, lots of uh, physical assets have been improved over the years. I have, as I said, being a vice chair of Veterans and Military Affairs Committee, I've had the opportunity to continue to have briefings there and be brought up to date. That particular installation has the capability of training all five branches of the military as well as international military uh, 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 personnel as well come to Fort McCoy for training. 
Now, their annual throughput of personnel at Fort McCoy, would you like to guess what it might be? Anybody? 150,000 military personnel can be trained through Fort McCoy annually. Uh, the economic footprint in our region is $1 billion from Fort McCoy. So the reason why I put all this in context for you is to indicate, of course, the type of capability with their personnel on the ground there for these various types of mission. So fast forward to August this year. Um, many of you, I'm sure all of you are, are aware of our withdrawal from Afghanistan. And it was announced that Afghan evacuees would be brought over to the United States. And Fort McCoy was advised 10 days before their mission would start. And so 10 days before they were to receive a maximum capacity at that time of 10,000 Afghan evacuees. And so uh, it was right at the end of August, Senator Teston, myself, along with Senator Johnson, and a number of our other um, legislators within the region were able to have a briefing. Now, I'd also like to remind you, many of you, of course, have served in the military, so you understand the, the structure of uh, the, the way missions are assigned and the way that some of that uh, process, of course, works. So the State Department is in charge of the, the uh, designating those missions to the, the various installations around the country. And then, of course, Homeland Security. And then, as I said, 10 days before the mission was to begin, it was designated to Fort McCoy, and they had to prepare. So when we went there to meet uh, Homeland Security and, of course, uh, the State Department, at that time, there were 6,500 Afghan evacuees at the base, or as they call them, guests. And it is, of course, a resettlement mission. It is not a security mission. The objective is, when we originally were, were briefed, was that those evacuees would be able to be resettled somewhere in the United States within 14 to 21 days of them arriving at Fort McCoy. However, that is not the case. The, um, as time has gone by, and the, the organizations that ultimately are assisting in this are the, what they call NGOs, non-government organizations. And some of those can be affiliated with religious organizations like the Catholics or the Lutheran organizations. And they will help alongside Homeland Security building biographies for the Afghan evacuees. And also to get them in touch with say a sponsor or family member within the United States as I said, when we were advised that the mission was to begin, the maximum capacity would be 10,000 individuals. That has now grown to 13,000. Currently, at Fort McCoy, there's 12,500. The last that uh, I was, I, my last briefing was about a week ago. So those NGOs, because of the number of evacuees that are at Fort McCoy, um, there are now more NGOs coming onto the base to help them so that they can begin to um, leave that base and get into a, their, their normal life and settle into life in America. Um, I, you know, I hope that all of them, of course, are successful. And uh, uh, I'm a second generation American on one side of my family. And, you know, I always hear about the stories of how exciting it was to come here and, and that hopefulness and that opportunity. So I wish that for all of those individuals. I can't imagine what it was like, you know, to go through that type of evacuation and really pretty trauma-filled um, event. But at any rate, um, that mission, because of the large volume of individuals that are still at Fort McCoy, that mission is expected now to be extended into probably March or even a little bit later. And initially, um, I know many people ask, where would we expect the evacuees to settle? And we were told by the State Department initially 
that about a quarter were expected to go to Northern California, Sacramento area. And then of course the Virginia area would probably receive about a quarter, but many of those um, individuals that would go to Virginia were already working, say, with embassies or with the Americans. So that's why Virginia, many of you may wonder why Virginia. And then the other half would disperse throughout the United States. At this point, we expect about 400 to stay in, in Wisconsin. Um, I also wanted to add that uh, you know, of course, English could be a barrier for some of the individuals. And there were, during the evacuation, during our last briefing, we learned there, I think it was about 148 individuals from the Afghan University who are now with the Afghan evacuees. And they are doing the, the English um, lessons, of course, for them. There's also a other, um, like they do town hall meetings because there are elders from various um, components of their society who help in organizing or leading their, their society. So that's a very important part of getting that information to all the evacuees on the base. Um, and of course, you know, when you put 13,000 people in a, in a county in between two communities, Toma and Sparta, that have about 9,500 people each. That's just in the city. Um, that is really quite a strain, and it could be on some of our local resources. You know, we are concerned about health care capacity. And right now we have 200 Afghan women who are pregnant, and I understand most are due in December. So also, um, you know, there's a number of those infrastructure concerns that we have. So. In the interest of time, this is, I think this is a very interesting topic. Um, I also want to add finally that initially we thought most of the evacuees would be SIV holders, special immigrant visa holders, but they were not and ended up being a very, very small percentage. But what all of them did receive is a refugee parole. And what that means is that for eight months, there is quite a detailed list of services that they receive, health care, um, uh, having uh, an opportunity, a place to live, guidance for a job, et cetera. And I'm really keeping that very brief. But then also, it being a refugee parole is, is a, a defined as having that opportunity of, of having that status because they came from an at-risk country. And so that had to be accomplished very quickly. So if you do have questions, I will do my best to answer them for you. And we continue to have briefings, of course. Um, and I suggest to reach out to Senator Tiffany, or rather Congressman Tiffany's office, or Senator Johnson. And of course, if you do have a question, please reach out to either one of us. And we're happy to try to find those answers for you as well. So, thank you. Thank you. Obviously, a huge topic in Wisconsin Rapids, Central Wisconsin, is the status of the mill right up the street. And I didn't know, Senator, did you have any kind of an update you could provide? I don't know. Just maybe folks obviously are interested in what's going on, if, if anything, or if you know anything. I know lots. So to give an update, as most people are aware, through the Rapids Together Task Force that Representative Krug and I, Representative Vandermeer, Representative Shanklin, and our stakeholders and partners at both the federal and local level for literally over the last year and a half um, collectively came together. And I was really encouraged by the work that we were doing with the Rapids Together Task Force because Essentially, we took the politics out of everything and basically put our heads together and said, all right, how can we come together to one, provide resources for those workers and families impacted, and two, what can we do to find a solution to get the mill open back up? Because as I've said before, it, it's a shame that this is a mill that has survived two world wars, a Great Depression, countless economic downturns, but yet it always had managed to keep its doors open. And yet here we are in October of 2021 and it, doors remain closed. 
So um, back in May, when the U.S. Treasury came out with their initial guidelines for how ARPA dollars could be used, the American Rescue Plan, it was pretty clear to us, myself and Representative Krug, that while it didn't say explicitly you could use the federal dollars that were being provided um, to the state to provide a loan to reopen a mill in Wisconsin Rapids, but it was still, the language was pretty clear that the dollars would be appropriately used for um, helping businesses or various industries that were impacted by the pandemic as well as the government responses to the pandemic. And so, uh, late May, uh, Representative Krug and I, we released the bill that would have provided a loan of upwards of uh, $50 million for both the Mills and Park Falls and Wisconsin Rapids to provide a loan through WEDC, the Wisconsin Economic Development Corporation, that would be paid back within three years under the federal guidelines. So we introduced the bill, and for roughly about a month, um, we thought we were in good shape. It went through the committee process in both houses, and then was scheduled for the floor in the assembly, um, what was that, that would have been end of June? And it wasn't until the night before that the assembly took the bill up for a vote that myself and Representative Krug got on a phone call with Governor Evers, WEDC Secretary Missy Hughes, uh, Senate Minority Leader Janet Buley, and then um, a few other legis a few other lawmakers as well. And in our conversation, it became clear that uh, the governor had some issues with the bill that we had drafted, to which we replied, okay, governor, what's, what's the issue? Because this bill has been out there for a month and we have heard nothing from you or your administration. And so the governor said, well, I have an issue with the legislature basically saying how the federal dollars can be directed. So under the, under the ARPA bill that was passed by Congress and signed into law by President Biden, the state was going to receive <clears throat> roughly $2.5 billion to deal with um, the pandemic and responses to the pandemic. And so just like the CARES Act, much of this money, if not all of the money, goes directly to the governor's administration to dole out to deal with the pandemic through his uh, various agencies and administration. So the governor took issue with the fact that um, the legislature was going to intervene and direct where some of this money would be. And so in his amendment, uh, he wanted to swap out the federal dollars and use um, general purpose revenues, which is essentially state tax dollars. Now, the issue with that was is that it was clear that this was going to be a poison pill for the bill because at the same time within the American Rescue Plan uh, Act was that Congress imposed what was called the maintenance of effort. So for every new dollar that the state spends in GPR, we have to then invest an additional 80 cents on every new dollar spent into K-12 education. So for instance, if you had a bill that had a dealt out $100 million, well, that automatically turns it into a $180 million bill. What Congress has essentially done is um, they have inserted themselves into every single state house in the country and have essentially tied our hands on, on budgetary matters at the state level, which is very concerning to me and from my perspective, is a gross violation of the 10th Amendment. However, that being said, um, because of that amendment, we told the governor, look, we will look it over. We will have a conversation and see if there's any way we can make this work. So the day that the assembly took it up on the floor, myself and Representative Krug, again, we put our heads together to see if there was any other viable option that we could do um, to get this bill to the governor that he could actually sign. And it became abundantly clear there was no other option. This was the only option. What was extremely unfortunate though, that in the middle of the floor debate, as Representative Krug got up and explained as to why we could not take the governor's amendment because it would essentially kill the bill, um, the governor put out a statement that basically said, and mischaracterized the conversation that we had, that we had and said, we had a deal, Representative Krug, Senator Keston have walked away from the table that we weren't acting in good faith and it was extremely disappointing because up until that point we had all been on the same page and then at the last second at the very last second things changed and it became clear that this was now going to be used as a, a political pawn and for me personally I find that very insulting because for all those families and for this community that have been impacted by that that mill is not a game. It's not a chess piece on a board. And unfortunately, that's what it's become. 
However, we remain committed, myself, Nancy, Scott, and others, to continue to find options. We continue to have conversations with the Wisconsin Paper Council, with the Timber Cooperative, to hopefully continue to find a solution to move forward. I am encouraged that Atlas put forth a, a deal that I personally think Versa would be crazy not to take. However, I know there are still ongoing conversations with their board of directors and their shareholders to see if uh, they're going to take that. But I remain optimistic and hopefully we'll have a resolution here in the near future. Thank you. We're going to have uh, time for comments and open discussion. So if folks want to comment on things, we, we will have time for that this morning. You did mention the ARPA funds and things. There's, um, maybe, if Nancy, if both of you could just kind of talk about a little bit you, kind of what those are, where they are, what you may see in the future, just kind of the whole, I guess everything continues around the whole COVID issue and just kind of where all that stands. If you could, if you, could if you have anything to update us on. So again, um, the state received roughly $2.5 billion in the latest uh, federal action that took place earlier this year. So if you remember going back to April of 2020, Congress passed what was then under President Trump and his administration, the CARES Act, in which case the state received just shy of $2 billion. And again, most of that money was directly, strictly to the governor's administration. Wisconsin was one of the few states in the entire nation that passed a comprehensive omnibus bill to basically leverage those federal dollars to have the governor use his to use within his administration. What was a little concerning though at the time is that as the state received this massive influx of money from the federal government, um, unfortunately the response and the money to get out the door was rather slow because it took roughly three months for the administration to spend less than 4% of that uh, nearly $2 billion in the first round of the CARES Act. Then the ARPA dollars came down. And initially, the legislature, we came in early on and said, here's how we would like to direct this money, whether it was broadband expansion, providing more money for our frontline medical providers to a whole host of different issues. We passed roughly, what was it, 13 bills that would have directed how this money could be spent because having been through this now for the better part of a year, and from what we've heard and seen on the ground directly from our respective constituents in our districts, we figured, okay, we understand why the first round of money went directly to the governor, but I think, we think we should have a seat at the table. So of those 13 bills, all 13 got vetoed, which was unfortunate. So right now, the governor has used a lot of this money for various initiatives. Um, what was rather interesting though, and the money that was, came in most recently to the state of Wisconsin, as of um, was mid-August, I had a conversation with DOA Secretary Joel Brennan, and in a fleeting moment of transparency, um, I asked how much of this money has gone out the door, how much of this has been allocated, and at the time, come to find out that of nearly the $2.5 billion that was allocated to the administration, they had roughly $419 million in reserve for what was designated as future use. Now in that time frame, some of that money has been spent down. We have seen some initiatives go towards uh, minority owned businesses, which I think is great, but at the same time, we could open that up for all businesses because every single business in the state of Wisconsin has been impacted detrimentally over the course of the last year and a half. Um, there was an initiative re released recently this week that was going to provide money and resources for, uh, to study violence, which, great, but I think, again, that money would be better used if we could provide more resources to cities like Milwaukee, who have seen a huge surge in crime in recent months because they have a police force that is adequately underfunded and understaffed, and there's a whole lot of host of other concerns, but um, that's kind of the state of the play right now with a lot of these federal dollars, and I'll let Nancy fill in any of the blanks. I think you did a very fine job in giving us an overview. Um, and also the timeline for spending those dollars is can go up to 2024, as you well know. So um, given that it was in response to COVID, I think it's very interesting that we're given um, nearly three years to spend those dollars. 
Uh, also, I think it's important, um, just as a footnote to your comments, you know, you gave some very granular details on that, but I think it's also important to note that when we did design and pass those 13 bills, I had a couple through my Rural Development Committee as well, uh, and the, I thought they were great. Um, one had to do with rural broadband expansion. That is something that we desperately need all throughout the state. It's so important in the context of what had happened in COVID, and of course, workforce attraction, hybrid working, all of that. Um, issue, but I think that it is um, so important to note that uh, we we really need to include those funds. They are sources of revenues, and we did acknowledge that in our budget as well. Because from my business background, I didn't segregate certain parts of my gross income in my business off to the side and say, well, I won't pay attention to that. To be a good manager, in my estimation, all of those sources of funding need to be accounted because we are accountable to all of you, our taxpayers, the people that we work for here in Wisconsin. So I'm so glad that you gave the details on those numbers and the fact that we should be using those sources of revenue as we indicated and be a good partner and with the governor and the governor be a good partner with us as well. <clears throat> And just to add on to that as well, so not only did the state receive a massive influx of money from the federal government, our local units of government have also received money. So every municipality, whether you're a city, village, or town, or county, um, received, should have received at least their first payment if they apply for their um, uh, COVID relief dollars. On top of that, um, for a lot of municipalities, if you are not aware, a, another resource for you is you can go onto the Wisconsin Towns Association website because some genius in uh, the U.S. Treasury Department came up with a calculator for lost mm -hmm. revenue. And it's not a formula that most of us would probably take a look at. Take a look at last year's revenues compared to this year's revenues. And if it's less than last year, well then obviously you're in the red. They have a very complex calculator that you can plug in the formulas and then there's it's another avenue for um, local municipalities to use more revenue. And there are there are certain restrictions that can be used for these dollars. However, while there are some restrictions, they are very broad in other places as well. So if you can justify how to spend these dollars, it's really sky's the limit. And you have the ability to pool your resources, both at the county and the local level, to pitch in. So if there are projects that you have been holding off on, you do have the opportunity to look into that a little bit deeper and to see if you can use some of those federal dollars for your projects that are on the books or you hope to uh, tackle here in the next year or so. I know health care is a huge issue for both of you. Maybe any update on what you're hearing. Obviously, the, the news is full of things about health care as we kind of continue on with our health issue. What are you hearing from the folks in health care? Any, any initiatives that you can share with us? I'll give this to both of you here. Certainly. Thank you. Um, yes, we could have a, a separate session here just on health care issues, as many of you are aware. Um, just to give you an update on what I've been working on is I'm on the health committee, as I said, and in the past several years, many of you are familiar with my work that I've done on health care licensure compacts, and this has proven to be a very successful way of making more access through our various healthcare providers, professionals, to our constituents, to our patients here in Wisconsin. And when we do that, we create, of course, better access, and that leads to better outcomes. And during the pandemic, of course, you know, many people put off, you know, different non-essential type um, uh, procedures or assessments in their healthcare uh, continuum and so we didn't give up though we kept working on a lot of those issues i have done a healthcare compact of course interstate licensure compact for physician licensure and you know that comes from my background i'm being familiar with credentialing in the hospital settings of course and then uh, two years ago we did an enhanced nurse licensure compact 
and that upgraded our nurse licensure so that it's a voluntary process. You can go through the, the prior licensure or the you have two different tracks that you can follow, but um, you can do just the state of Wisconsin nurse licensure or you can do the compact licensure. And why is this important? Why is it beneficial? The states who belong to the compact, for example, um, when you get a nursing license through that compact, um, last count we had at least 28 states in that compact. Those nurses have license reciprocating licensing in those other 28 states. And we had done this, of course, before the pandemic. And I can recall, of course, at our public hearing for that bill, it was brought up that, you know, this is really a, a very good tool to use in the event that we would have a national emergency. And we're thinking like hurricanes. Those nurses could de be deployed to those areas of the country where there was a extreme weather event, where those medical services were needed. Little did we realize, of course, that we would face a nationwide pandemic, you know, here two years later. So it is also very beneficial, not only in those circumstances, but also in um, border regions, you know, where you have two different states and people may com commute back and forth. That's very important. Uh, we also have visiting nurses, for example, and telemedicine. So we took that same type of um, template from our Enhanced Nurse Licensure Compact. And now this session, we have applied it to an Occupational Therapy Compact. And that's very important, especially for people, as I said, who have put off some of these non-essential type medical um, treatments over the pandemic, that they could have access um, you know, to therapists like occupational therapists. So that bill is still working its way through our process. And of course, there would be to enact one of these compacts, there has to be a required number of states in the compact. So right now we need 10 to activate the compact and we would be number nine. So we would just need one more. And it's important to us as a state to be one of the um, initial states in a compact because it allows us to have a voice in the design of the compact as well. So I don't want to get too much in the weeds, but that is one of the ways that we can help with workforce shortages, with access number one for best outcomes for patients, but then also it's so important for our rural areas having access to these various healthcare providers and pro professionals. And so that's important, I always say too, for economic development, because it strengthens our local healthcare systems by having that array of healthcare professionals accessible to them as well. So thank you. Well, great. Nancy uh, did a great job there. So I chaired the Senate Health Committee in the State Senate, and um, I think one of the biggest takeaways that we've seen from this last year and a half um, are some of the flexibilities that we gave to our medical professionals to deal with the to deal with the pandemic. That we have proven that you can take some regulation off the backs of our medical community and still be able to provide top-notch quality care. And one of the bills that we are currently working on is a bill that would allow our advanced practice nurses to operate at the highest level of their scope. This is a bill that has been in circulation the last three sessions, so basically six years, that for me personally, I think makes a lot of sense. Um, Senator Lemmy Hume authored it the last two sessions. Uh, now that he's the Senate Majority Leader, I, he asked me to uh, be the lead author on it, uh, this go around. And so, um, it's one of those bills that it always got introduced, but then for one reason or another, it always got torpedoed uh, behind the scenes. But we were finally at a point where uh, the bill was heard in both the Senate and the Assembly Health Committee because um, since I took the, the lead author role on it, we basically brought in all the stakeholders, the nurses, some of the other organizations that had concerns with the bills of previous years that basically sit around the table and hash out the the different points of view to the point where um, we finally, I think we got most of the stakeholders uh, at our last go around 
as they walked out of the room, I noticed that no one was happy. So I think we've landed in a pretty good spot. And from my perspective, it just makes sense. 22 other states allow their advanced practice nurses to operate at the highest scope of their license. Yet Wisconsin is one of those outliers where we don't. And some of the opponents of the bill will tell you, well, if, if uh, they're able to practice independently, and it's not even the ability to practice independently, it's just the ability to do the job that they're trained to do. Um, their argument is, is that it'll drop the quality of care for their patients. However, in the other 22 states that have allowed their advanced practice nurses to operate, operate at the highest level of their scope, there is no quantitative data to suggest that the quality of care has decreased. In actuality, the quality of care increases because it turns out when you allow people to operate at the highest level of their license, they're going to provide better outcomes and more opportunities and increase access for patients. Um, some of the other areas that we continue to work on is just expanding coverage, making sure that we have more providers. This continues to be an issue on a whole host of areas, whether it's mental health, whether it's in dentistry, nursing, doctors, you name it. We have a demographic problem here in the state that we need to be much more proactive on as it relates to not just our medical profession, but as well as our entire workforce. I will say this, I do have some concern right now because as some of the mandates that have come down from various providers here in the state, as we've seen with the vaccine mandate that has come down from uh, President Biden's administration, one of the concerns that I've had as I've talked to a number of different stakeholders is that there is great concern that a significant population of folks within the medical community may walk off the job. What's unfortunate is that for the last year and a half, these were individuals that were labeled as heroes who are on the front line every single day fighting the pandemic, taking care of patients, and now they're being vilified and potentially ostracized that they're not going to have a job if they refuse to have a medical procedure done to them. When some of these providers came down um, with their, their mandates, we asked, I called up a number of them and said, what is your plan B? What is your plan B if what it's 10%, 15%, maybe upwards of 20% of your workforce walks off the job. What's the plan B? Especially in a time when we've seen in recent cases, cases go off. Seems like we're starting to tail off though on and starting to go back down. But if there's another surge and we don't have the bodies needed to take care of these patients, um, we have not gotten an answer if there's a plan B. So that continues to be a, a topic that we continue to uh, look after, and um, my hope is, is that common sense will prevail, and hopefully uh, we're not going to be forcing people that we called heroes a year and a half ago out of work. You can, why don't you keep the, the mic? I know youth apprenticeship is a huge issue. It's been since the minute you walked into your office in Madison. Can you give us an update on some of the things? Why is that, a, why is that kind of one of your topics, and we're, I know you would introduce a bill, maybe multiple bills at this point. Kind of what? What's the youth apprenticeship? What's it look like out there for you? So the youth apprenticeship, Wisconsin has been a national leader on this front, uh, going back to the early '90s when this program was first created, and has expanded over the years into I believe it's 11 or 13 different job clusters where we allow high school students to actually get real hands-on experience. When we talk about workforce, we have to be much more proactive rather than reactive to ensure that we train up our future workforce, that we retain our workforce right here in the state, and more importantly, we attract a workforce from outside of the state of Wisconsin. Because just like 49 other states in, in the United States right now, uh, we are a state that continues to age. And when you take a look at our demographics, our population that is 65 or older is set to increase exponentially over the next five to seven years. And that is going to put a tremendous strain on a whole host of systems, whether it's our Medicaid budget, our healthcare system, long-term care, manufacturing, agriculture, and uh, even truck drivers right now, which is one of the primary reasons why when I took office back in January 2017, we made it a point that I would go out and work a different job in my district for a day just to highlight, highlight what different job opportunities are out there. And so what's great about the Youth Apprenticeship Program and why I think we need to expand on it and create more pathways and create more talent pipelines for our youth is so that way we can break the narrative that the only way you can get a good career is to go to a great four-year college uh, campus like UWSP, for instance. Um, but four-year colleges are great, but they're not for everyone. 
And so we have to break that narrative and, sh and show individuals that you can go to a technical college, you can go directly into the trades, you can go directly into the workforce. I mean, right now it is a gold mine for workers. You go around any business right now in Wisconsin or Rapids, Port Edwards, Nakusa, and as I've traveled around the state, it is statewide. Help wanted signs are in every window front. Companies that are willing to sign, have sign-in bonuses upwards of $2,000. I saw one company for a bus driver company when I was at the state fair, $5,000 sign-on bonus. I contemplated signing up. Um, so one of the bills that we did that is going to help highlight and promote the youth apprenticeship program, and many of our schools in the area already do this, but there are a number of schools that's, that haven't quite bought in yet. And so this bill would require that um, school districts provide information to not only students but also parents that they have the youth apprenticeship program and the opportunities that the youth apprenticeship program uh, can give them. So that way we're highlighting the program because I think that's one of the biggest points of frustration that I have is that in state government and at, whether it's at the federal level, state or even at the local level, we have all these tremendous programs that do great things but if people don't know about them what good is it? It's kind of like that age-old question, or the, the, the old saying, if a tree falls in the woods and no one's there to hear it, did a tree fall in the woods? And so just trying to raise awareness that these programs are available so hopefully we can get more buy-in and then show the worth of the program and then hopefully in future administrations and legislatures we can expand on that because again, we need to do everything that we can to retain and attract our workforce right here in the state. Mm -hmm. And I just wanted to, to add on to that comment. Sorry, no, yeah. Thank you for your work in that, of course. And these programs are very successful. So I just want to piggyback on that as um, from my own personal experience. We did a, in fact, um, when I talked about being involved in the school to work program in my own community, we started that program from scratch in Toma. And so we saw that grow. It grew to be very successful. There are still businesses, of course, that do that. Um, we were fortunate to have students come into our service department and be mentored by some very well-trained individuals. And uh, you never know who um, is going to be working with you in some of those situations. Um, we had very highly skilled people at, at our business, of course. And I think it inspired a number of our students to stay in that industry and go on to careers and that were associated with it. And so I just wanted to piggyback on how successful it can be. It's not always temporary, but I think um, not only the technical skills um, in the youth apprentice or school to work programs, it also gives those students an opportunity to work with a diverse set of individuals other than just being with our um, colleagues or our cohorts in the school setting. And uh, so they get to work with different age ranges, different levels of ability, see what it's like to be in an actual work setting. I think that's an absolutely valuable experience. And then I also want to piggyback on that comment. My husband still does school to work. And so he sees the same things that, that I commented on. Many of those students, they go on and want to work in an agricultural related field. And so this is a wonderful way, of course, before students make that investment in their education, that they have that hands-on. And so that they are really invested, not only with their dollars, but they're invested personally in knowing that they have a passion for a certain field. So I just wanted to piggyback on, on your good work too. So thank you. Thank you, and I can say in my time with Domtar, our senator's a pretty darn good paper maker. He went into the Nakusa mill at seven in the morning and worked an eight hour shift. Uh, the only problem was after a shift was over, we said, sorry, we can't hire you. So, but anyway, you know, easy come, easy go. And I also feel like I should apologize. You mentioned this thing about 65 year old folks in the next five to seven years. Well. I'll be 62 in two weeks, so I guess I feel like I should almost apologize. I'm, gonna, I'm trying, you know, I'm trying here. Um, 
Nancy, I know you mentioned your your husband and your family's background in agriculture. A couple minutes on anything going on in the egg world, whether it be cranberries, uh, crops, dairy, anything in your world on that? Certainly, thank you. Well, of course, all of you, just a little plug, all of you know it's harvest time. And with that comes a lot of challenges. So just kind of a heads up, you know, from what I'm hearing from my husband, uh, he's harvesting corn. We're seeing uh, challenges with tar spot on corn harvesting. That needs to come off the fields early. That's why you're seeing a lot of that coming off the fields. Um, we're in the swing of cranberry harvest and getting all of those processed as well throughout our district. Uh, but as far as I said, I, I also serve on the Agriculture Committee, and over the last couple sessions, I was very passionate about agriculture research. And so in this last budget, I was able to sponsor a budget motion, which I had also previously introduced as legislation as well. And what it was was to work with our UW-Madison CALS, College of Agriculture and Life Sciences. And that is for research, of course. And this would be peer review, applied research right in the field, work with our producers. And it was so widely supported, of course, by our corn um, growers, soybean growers, cranberry, dairy, pork, beef. And it's very important because it can respond to, as I talked about, some of the current issues that are going on right in the field. So how we can best come alongside our farmers and make sure that we preserve that $104.8 billion agriculture industry. And that's usually vies for our first or second um, economic position in our state. So that is very, very important. So what we did in that particular budget motion was, as I said, allow for a million dollars per year of the two-year biennium for that research to take place at CALS. And then through the UW extension, it becomes disseminated to our producers right in the field. Um, we also have a cranberry research station right over in Millston. That's new, that came about um, the last several years. Um, also Hancock Research Station that's not too far as well. So that takes place right here in the heart of really our districts and is just so absolutely vital. So I look forward to seeing those um, particular areas in, improve, create more information for those growers. And the types of um, things that they will research just for example is water quality number one, um, pest control, or even farm economics. So it can be quite a broad range. And I think that type of research also dovetails well with another provision that was in our budget for agriculture, and that's producer-led watersheds. And I know of a very successful one right in our district up in Portage County. And what that does is marry our producers' best practices within this watershed with um, people who want to make sure there is good water quality and quantity, of course, in our region. And it introduces our producers uh, to practices like um, um, ground, ground covers and uh, all of that type of good soil conservation, water quality con conservation for our agriculture partners. So it's a and of course, good farmers want to make sure that they protect those assets because long term, that's what makes a good farm too. So, so I'll pass it on to the senator here. If you have anything, I think you crushed it. <laughs> okay. Uh, you can keep it, Senator. I don't want to really make this a political forum or a campaign stop, but obviously, you made the news a couple of weeks ago. You want to. Looks like you're looking at maybe going to a different wing of the Capitol at some point, maybe a little bit about the decision to your future. Yeah, so um, a few weeks ago I made the announcement that I was going to run for uh, lieutenant governor for the state. And one of the reasons why I decided to throw my hat into this race is just the general sense of frustration um, 
with, with the current trajectory that we're on with this administration. It seems like all we do anymore is play defense. And, you know, it, it's been tough. There hasn't really been a relationship between the administration and the legislature. And I understand that is a two-way street. And I also will be the first to say that the relationship between the new administration didn't start off on the best of feet with um, the legislature and the administration when we had the extraordinary session between the transition to Governor Walker and now Governor Evers. However, we did extend the olive branch on many occasions to say, Governor, there are going to be areas for us to work together on, but know that there are going to be some areas that we're just not going to have agreement on. And similar to what I've always done at the start of our recession, I reach out to my Democratic colleagues in the state Senate and tell them, look, if you guys have ideas that you think we can work together on, know that my door is always open. And for my colleagues that have taken me up on that offer, they always come in, we sit down, we have a good conversation, and we basically define the playing field of what we can get behind and know, and know that there are going to be areas that I won't be comfortable uh, getting behind and knowing that there are going to be areas that I know they won't be comfortably, comfortable getting behind. But we establish that common ground and then build upon that, and it, we've been able to actually get things done, which has been nice. When you take a look at um, you know, what we were able to do in the state budget that thankfully the governor did sign, however, had his budget been enacted as it was introduced, I think it would have put Wisconsin on a radically different course than, what we're, than where we're at right now, where um, right now in our rainy day fund, we have over a billion dollars. Our checkbook right now has roughly a one point billion dollar surplus. And compare that in contrast, had the proposed budget been introduced, um, we'd be looking at billion dollar deficits, billion dollar tax increases, and that concerns me given the fact that so many of our small businesses were on a razor's edge over the last year and a half. There was a reason why so many lifelines had been thrown out, whether it was the PPP loans that came down, making sure that we didn't tax those, just to ensure that there was a, a life raft to keep these businesses, these jobs afloat. And despite our best efforts, um, in the legislature, it's still clear that far too many people are suffering. When you take a look at what happened with the mill bill, which still to this day makes my blood boil. Um, when you take a look at the debacle that happened at the Department of Workforce Development, where we still have constituents nearly a year and a half later that have yet to receive their unemployment compensation. A year and a half later. That was probably, probably one of the most frustrating experiences in my time in office was just constantly receiving phone calls from constituents, some who were literally bawling their eyes up and didn't know what they were going to do because they had no income and they had no idea when that support was going to come in. And when we would call over the DWD and say, what is the status on this constituent's claim? And to have people basically say, just stop calling us. We're overworked. We're overwhelmed. That's a problem. I think one of the reasons why I got into the race that I did is because I see a lot of opportunity, not just for central Wisconsin, but for the entire state as we look forward to 2022 and beyond to get our economy back on the right track, to provide more pathways and opportunities for our, our students, um, to get government out of the way, and more importantly, continue to ensure that the state's a, a great place to live, work, and raise a family. Thank you both. Uh, any Questions, comments from our audience? John. Well, I'd like to, uh, first of all, thank you both for being here. Um, I'm John Bergen. I spent uh, 15 years of my life in that paper mill. Uh, production management and division management. In fact, I was there when we built 16. Actually, John, I think I'll give you this. So okay. <clears throat> we can hear you, but that way we can. So it's, uh, Dear and dear to my heart, I've joined with the timber producers on the uh, consolidated uh, co-op board, if you will. But I think there's huge impact to this community, and I would just like to cite some numbers that hopefully will be motivation for you to take some action. In 2000, the, the uh, community foundation encouraged created a document called Vital Signs, and they updated that a number of years. In 2000, the median family income here in Wisconsin Rapids was 58,000. In 2012, it was 49,000. I have the data from the 
2019 census emphasis, uh, and it is 42,000. So that's what's happened. We have $16,000 less median family income 21 years later. That's an incredible impact on this community. So hopefully we can rethink the mill bill, okay? Um, in working with the timber producers and a, a group of resources, we have put together a viable business plan going forward. Now, Atlas, um, we don't think Verso was motivated to sell the mill for anything other than scrap. That's, there may be others who say that's controversy. I don't know whether Atlas will have any different view, but I would hope that we could, through some positive legislation, be in a position to make an offer on that mill that's viable should Atlas decide not to. Now, what is their motivation? Their motivation, obviously, the most important raw material for Quinnisec and Escanaba, as well as this mill, is the lumber, the wood that goes into that mill every day. That's the most important raw material, the biggest expense. They are saving huge amounts of money. But there's also a grand implication statewide. Look at what happens to the loggers. Look at what happens to the landowners. Look at the programs that require harvesting and maintaining your forest. How can you implement that if you don't have a market? So I think this has a broad scope impact on the state of Wisconsin, and I would like to see some very strong motivation to make a difference. Thank you. Senator, would you like to yeah. make some comments on that? Yeah, I 100% agree with you. I mean, that's one of the reasons why we, we passed the mill bill that was unfortunately vetoed. And one of the, what I believe the timber cooperative, what this could provide is a revolutionary model for the paper industry. Because what we have seen for years now, going on decades, is that mills get purchased by private equity firms and then things like deferred maintenance get put off and they basically try and squeeze every drop of blood out of the stone and then they sell it. They essentially turn and burn the plants and they change hands. Whereas with this model, it could be revolutionary in the sense that you have people who are bought into the process from when they plant the tree to when they cut the tree to when that truck rolls out the door with rolls of paper in the back, that you would actually have ownership at the local level. And so we continue to be hopeful. What I would really like to see long-term is that we think bigger. So oftentimes when we see industries such as the paper industry take a take a hit is that you'll often see times we'll come come to the legislature and we'll introduce bills that deal specifically for that that particular mill which there is nothing wrong with that by any means but i think we need to think bigger as it relates to our paper industry here in the state which has been a bedrock since our state's foundation and i would personally love to see us create a revolving loan fund over at wedc specifically for the paper industry and our forestry industry so that when issues come up that we can again provide that lifeline for these industries to uh, retrofit renovate find new products to make find new markets and so that way we can ensure that this is not going to be an industry of the past here in the state but that this can be an industry of the future with future growth future investment and uh, new opportunities i just wanted to say thank you john for your work at the mill and uh, for your vision and hoping to continue on with it. And I certainly support Scott Krugan and Senator Justin and their efforts as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> we have time for, yep, yes, sir. Sir, uh, Ray Boster, Village of Medicaid, Fort Edwards, and a uh, 35 year Army veteran retired. Thank uh, you for your service. Well, thank you, sir. Thank you, you too, for what you all do, for any of you all serving in government service. Uh, you touched on two great topics. Uh, refugees at Fort McCoy, as well as the ARPA. Uh, the refugee thing set aside, they're here. We got it. We've accepted them. 
We'll do what we can with them and help them. My concern is what's next. Having lived through Vietnamese boat refugees, the Cuban refugees, the, all the other things that America, they came to America and we as Americans tried to help, failed miserably in all those circumstances. What I don't want to see is this experiment fail again. When the limelight's done, the news people go away, the funding goes away, we as a state will be stuck with the bill, stuck with dealing with whoever decides to settle here, stuck with that bill of resettling them, helping them, no resources, and our communities throughout Wisconsin, throughout America, are gonna be just left hanging, holding the bag. I think we need to put some energy, at least locally here, what we control, what's next. We're burning out the man days of our National Guard, doing a mission that's not a military mission. Resettlement camps are not a military mission. POW camps are. We can do that all day long and do it right. Resettlement camps, not. So they're losing their war fighting uh, ethics and their standards to do a mission that politically touchy-feely makes sense. All right. So I think we need to really look at how it's impacting us and to do those individuals do, do justice and, and take care of them when they migrate out into our communities, what's going to be available for us as municipalities to help them with resources and money? We need to worry about that because the NGOs, once that bill is paid and they get their $2,000 per refugee, are gone. They're going to be, thank you very much, I'm out of here. And who gets left holding the bag? So please put some energy into that moving forward. The ARPA, totally disagree with how our government, our state governor and his staff, is taking half of the money that we all paid into it and basically having little pet projects ponied out to his political friends. Totally disagree. Most other conservative states have taken that entire lump sum and given it all to the municipalities because that's where the rubber meets the road and people are held accountable. You give us $10 million, before I spend a dime, I gotta make sure my citizens are happy and agree. But this governor is basically circumventing the state budgeting process by taking billions of dollars and just doling it out. Totally disagree with that. And it's going to impact us as a state. So again, any efforts that you as a legislature can place on that individual to make him hopefully change his ways or at least dole it out more effectively and equity-wise across our communities, not just the Madisons and the Milwaukee's, would be very beneficial. That's all I got. Thank you. Thank you. Comments? I just want to say, number one, thank you for your commitment, your dedication, and your service to our country. And thank you for your continued passion for serving your community. Um, I really appreciate your comments. And please reach out to me. I'm going to leave you my card. And I hope that we can have a, a more detailed conversation in the future. Thank you. What's your schedule look like for the next year? I'd like you to take, take you around the state with me. Uh, no, I, I, I'm, a, I'm the refugees. <laughs> All right. Uh, I'm the refugee point. I, I'm with you 100%. And that's why when the news first broke that the refugees were going to come to Afghanistan, regardless of the situation, like you said, they're here. Now we have to deal with it. I basically sent a letter to Governor Evers to ask basic questions like, what do you know? Has the Biden administration briefed you? What is the long-term plan? Are these individuals going to qualify for programs like W-2, Badger Care, Medicaid, you name it? Because as Representative Vandermeer pointed out, initially we were briefed. We were told that they would be there for 14 to 21 days and then they would be permanently located. Well, we're going on a month and a half later and there are roughly 12 and a half thousand refugees still at Fort McCoy. So as of October 1, they have eight months where they receive these benefits from the federal government. After that, we're on the hook. And as we were briefed um, just last week, it's only going to be a handful at a time that are going out the door to get permanently relocated. So we are going to have a large population that still, after that eight months, that I believe will still be at Fort McCoy. And the question that remains, who's on the hook? Are the feds going to step in and reimburse the state? Basic questions that it took the governor three weeks to get back to us. Well, actually, it was his staff, and they basically said, well, um, it's a federal issue. We have nothing to do with it. Come to find out, well, we, we do have a lot to do with it. And so it concerns me. And then, yeah, on the ARPA funds, that continues to be a point of frustration because 
Um, what concerns me is that last I checked, and correct me if I'm wrong, Representative, but the legislature is a co-equal branch of government, correct? And the appropriating branch as well. Oh, that's right, and we appropriate money. In statute. In statute. So essentially, we have been just iced out of the process, which is why, again, it would, we thought it was our purview, especially in the second go around, that we introduced the bills on how we would like to see these ARPA dollars directed, because you were absolutely right. What we are seeing right now is that they are creating programs that essentially amount to crumbs to various communities and various industries that were shut down unilaterally with the stroke of a pen. And it does some of these loans and grants that are going out the door don't even cover uh, someone's overhead. And so it's frustrating because we see it every single day. We hear it every single day from our constituents, yet there seems to be this level of tone deafness right now at the administration. And despite our best efforts um, to insert ourselves in the process, it remains very difficult with the way that the federal government has uh, created some of these contingencies and how they have doled out these appropriations to the various states because essentially it gives these governors in every single state a basically a giant bag of monopoly money to use how they see fit use how they see fit and I wholeheartedly agree with your other point that it should be going back to the locals because it is the locals who have had to take this head-on and you guys can best address it at the local level however that's not how things have panned out to this point. And if I could, I wanted to add just one other thing. You touched on, um, you know, when we would come to the end of this particular mission, the resettlement mission. And I just want to add the um, Medicaid is the healthcare cover, coverage that's being provided to the evacuees. I also want to bear in mind that right now we get paid about 60 cents on the dollar at our local health care facilities and organizations. This is one of my concerns for our rural health care providers and hospitals. Because in the budget, we touched on some of the budget provisions earlier, we have something called um, disproportionate share funding. And I have advocated for that for ever since I became active in, in, the, in the assembly. And because it creates a shortfall and they're only getting paid, as I said, about 60 cents on the dollar. So that will make an impact to our local hospitals and healthcare providers. We already, as I said, as a state, backfill that for our, especially our uh, critical care hospitals, which are um, a lot of times in our rural areas, and those are defined as hospitals that see a large proportion of Medicaid patients. And so, you know, long term, I think that a very good point was presented here. And that's been one of my concerns as well. So thanks for letting me get into the details of that a bit. Thank you. Thank you. Way to the back of the room. Hi, everyone. Yeah. Uh, so, of course, thank you both for speaking today. Um, you know, as the Chamber of Commerce, uh, business is important to us, and one thing that's uh, directly impacting businesses beyond workforce is the supply chain. We had the privilege yesterday, uh, some of us in the room, to attend WMC Business Day, and we heard from an expert in the supply chain talking about the disruptions that have happened. Uh, Port of Los Angeles essentially is opening 24-7 now and um, increasing union shifts uh, to help that congestion that's happening. But what can we do on the state level to help that disruption, to even that out so our businesses aren't pushing back projects, the, you know, the increase of funding for uh, projects has increased significantly. I think it's above 200% on some projects and 80% on others. So how can we, um, on the state level, uh, is there anything that's happening? Is there anything we can do on the local level to help that uh, disruption kind of even out for our local businesses? You know, I, I think back to some of the things that we did um, in response, of course, to agriculture last session. For example, we did a bill that provided the harvest law to our milk carriers because they were prevented from driving on roads for, you know, certain hours. And, 
And so we made that availability to them. I think it's it's taking a look at regulation and where safely applicable, making sure that we are doing our best to allow people, you know, we talked about earlier, practicing to the full scope of their licensing. I think we need to look at how can we accomplish that as we can within the entire workforce. Um, you know, in our workforce, those who are participating, they are giving a lot right now. You know, as we heard, especially through the pandemics, we see that the many businesses, they can't operate to their full potential, you know, and that, that results in those supply chain shortages as well. Um, unfortunately, or fortunately, however you want to look at it, we are a global economy. And so much of the products that we need do come from other countries. And it has um, grown, of course, in, in the past several decades. And I would hope that we can certainly take a look at how do we get a lot of that business back here in the United States. And so it doesn't become just what can we do here in our state, but it's nationally as well. And uh, so it's, it's very challenging. And I think what we're seeing right now is, of course, the um, cascading effect of what took place during COVID and within our workforce as well. I don't think that there was a switch that was flipped and everything was going to go back to normal very quickly. I think a lot of this, of course, is the result of what took place over an 18-month period. So I will pass that on to the Senator. So that is a, a great question, Angel, and there is no question. I think these last 18 months have realized just how fragile our supply chain is. I mean, if you look back, and even to some extent now, go into a grocery store and shelves are bare. Go into a big box store and shelves are bare. I mean, it's very concerning to me, and especially at a time now where we can see, continue to see the consumer price index increase, inflation is up significantly. And so this is not only an issue locally, this is an issue nationally, it's also an issue internationally. And what was really eye-opening, so over the course of the, the summer, I was enrolled in a program through the U.S. State Department, through the ACYPL, the American Council on Young Political Leaders. Now, normally in this program, you would get to go travel abroad for two weeks and learn the ins and outs of a different country. Uh, we weren't able to do that for obvious reasons, and so it was a virtual exchange between countries of Japan and New Zealand. And it was eye-opening because every single conversation, it didn't matter what we talked about, everything circled back on China. And everyone in countries like Japan, talking to members of their parliament, talking to members of the New Zealand parliament, everyone acknowledges that, that China is a major problem and that we have become too reliant on that country. And as a result, we're seeing some of the issues that we are right now. The problem is no one ever, ever wants to stick their head up because, because of the reliance on China. So countries like Japan, New Zealand, they'll say privately, yep, this is a major issue, but yet they're so reliant on one country that they can't say it because fear of retaliation. And so it's gonna require efforts both internationally and at the federal level to deal with this, to hopefully decouple ourselves from what our reliance on China to open up new markets, new opportunities with other countries. That's why I was really encouraged uh, just last month when the ambassador from Taiwan, she was in the state of Wisconsin and had the opportunity to have dinner with her and um, several of my colleagues up in Wausau to promote the bilateral trade agreements between some of our ginseng growers and Taiwan to increase our export markets. And when we think about at the state level what we can do to help um, with our supply chain issues. Get government out of the way. When you take a look at some of the proposals that are being put forth through the Department of Agriculture, Trade and Consumer Protection, through the Department of Natural Resources that would detrimentally impact our ability for our farmers to do their jobs, to get their goods to market, that is problematic. So anything that we can do to ensure that we're getting the boot off the back of our individuals, such as our farmers, such as our manufacturers, I think that's going to go a long way to ensure that um, at least at the state level, we're doing what we can to ensure that our supply chain issues um, aren't as prevalent as they are in other parts of the country. Thank you very much. Let's give our elected officials a round of applause. We thank you for being here this morning. We have a couple minutes yet. Um, 
like to switch a little bit, if we could, to local. Uh, we have the mayor of Wisconsin Rapids, Shane Blazer. Thank you for your service. And you can sit right there if you wish. I'll give you the mic. If you could just kind of give us an update, some things maybe citywide or things you're looking on as we close up 2021 and move into next year. And thanks for being here. Thank you, Craig. John, please uh, forgive me. So I'm not much of a microphone holder. So if it ends up flying, please catch it for me. <laughs> Um, yeah, my name is Shane Blazer. I've been mayor for the past year and a half in Wisconsin Rapids. Um, a couple of things just to touch on what our representative said. I was on that infamous phone call and there was no deal struck with uh, the governor. Um, I've had the opportunity this last year to go testify in support of the mill bill. Uh, Alder person, uh, Dean Veneman, was also there. Um, a couple of things that they touched on about education, educational opportunities and partnerships in the state. Uh, a personal example, my daughter, she got a great education from Wisconsin Rapids School District. Uh, while she was there, she uh, took her CNA class and <clears throat> because of her extracurricular opportunities, she uh, went to mid-state over the summer and taken her uh, practicals and then ultimately her uh, exam and then you know, trying to trying to settle on that college to go to for the rest of your life, and you know, she was a typical uh, person who was not going to be close to home and uh, get away as far as possible. So we're touring, touring schools in Iowa, and thinking, wow, this is a long ways away to go. And so then I convinced her to go check out UWSP, and she's interested in nursing, and UWSP has a really unique uh, partnership in the state with our technical colleges. They offer a one-to-one -one program, it's called. It's actually like a one and a half, two and a half program, but they spend their first year, year and a half at uh, UWSP obtaining you know, the general ed educations, and then they transfer to a tech school. And there's a handful of tech schools that offer that opportunity where they can directly be accepted in the nursing program. And then after that, uh, they go back to UWSP and finish out their college to get their bachelor's degree, which is really a really unique opportunity. And it'd be great to see that expanded upon in other programs because, because of that value of that technical education program. I uh, spent my first part of my career in uh, law enforcement and had obtained my degree from UW Platteville. And the whole time I was there, I was, I was listening to uh, why we do things the way we do it now, kind of the theories behind it, but kind of lost that practical aspect that I would have gotten at a technical school. So. So once I got in law enforcement, I always uh, encouraged people that uh, maybe if they had an interest in law enforcement to start at technical school and then, then go on and find a bachelor's program, which uh, also most communities offer an educational incentive to do that. Locally, last night I presented my executive budget to the city council. Um, it's very flat. There's uh, no big projects, no nothing new in there, except we have an additional $800,000, unfortunately, but it's. It, it's a necessity. We have a state uh, highway or a state uh, road project going on in the community next year. So Jackson Street is going to be redone from the bridge all the way around backside to the expressway. Going to pull out the traffic lights finally and uh, kind of make that a little more local user friendly type of road. Um, I guess Angel could probably speak to it even better than me, but uh, uh, we have a consultant in town, Vanderwall. I was not able to participate last week in the tour, but the consultant is touring the mill site. Um, we had gotten a grant from, I believe it was the federal, and then also um, the HART applied for a grant through WEC to fund the other half of it. And there, it's a redevelopment grant to kind of try to find some uses that we could use for that space if we cannot turn that light switch back on again. So that's just started in the community. We have redistricting going on um, next year uh, our, our, it's going to be the first year we're going to have the, the 2022 honor walk in wisconsin rapids so grand rapids or grand avenue will have you know the banners highlighting uh you know past service members and i was told that they have next or 2022 full already they're already working on building up 2023 which will be a really great project if you go uh, behind chapo the fire department has already started its remodeling. We've done that just for, it started out as addressing gender inequity. 
And we are also there, and some uh, life and safety things came into it with uh, health hazards of fires. So we've done some remodeling there. And then Lee, I saw Lee here. I heard you. Our transportation utility is uh, kind of con con controversial, and so we're kind of working through that. But uh, we had a public hearing, and Lee was there, and it was really frustrating because we had a public hearing talking about creating this transportation utility. However, small businesses that were there expressed their concern because how do you pass an ordinance without knowing what it's going to cost? You know, I look at the school district. You know, that's going to have a direct impact on us. So. We've taken a step back where we've hired the consultant to finish the project. So hopefully anybody in the community can, can go to their, their parcel and figure out what that potential cost could be for them. Stand it up, Nate. Thank you. Uh, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Shane Sitz is the uh, chairman of the Southwood County Airport Commission, which uh, Nakusa, Port Edwards, Rapids, and Grand Rapids are members of exciting things I personally feel are happening there. Could you go into detail a little bit on our soon to be, I think, a regional airport? Wow, the airport, it's always interesting. And Joe is a member on the airport. You know, I, we're always looking at expanding. Uh, you know, I, I, the, the airport administrator reports to the, the city hires the person, but it's also, it's a collaboration between the municipalities and uh, the air, airport traffic is second to none. So we were at this uh, this uh, event yesterday with Angel and the airport administrator was supposed to be there with us, but he had so many jets planned to come in and take off that he was he had to cancel. Um, I guess anything specific you're looking to high on, high, highlight on Joe? I, unfortunately, the one controversial thing that's going on is that we have you know, our community around the airport is really growing up and so have the trees and so we have a federal project that's that's being uh, you know evaluated right now, but the approach angles for the for the runways have to we have to do a tree cutting thing, and the tree cutting is going to kind of expand into residential areas, which unfortunately is probably not going to go over the best. But but in the essence for the airport and what it does for our community, it, it's a necessity with the volume of jets that are flying in and uh, and the activity out there. We need to do this project. Any other questions? Thank you, sir. Thank, Thank you. you very much. <coughs> Look for another one, legislative breakfast in the spring. We are actually um, looking at planning that as we speak. Uh, might be a little different format. So um, appreciate everybody. We can only have these if we have people that have interest. So thank you very much. Also like to thank all of our elected officials in the room. Thanks for your service. Thank you also to our protective services folks. We certainly appreciate all that you do 24-7, 365 for us. Like to also thank uh, Wisconsin Rapids Community Media, a very big part of our community. If uh, how their programming has expanded in just the last couple of years is amazing. I mean, you, you can basically catch almost every church service in the area, most uh, government meetings, sports, everything else. We'd like to thank you for being here this morning, Wisconsin Rapids Community Media. And above all, we need to thank, you'll see it on your, um, on your tables, we need to thank Payroll and Bookkeeping LLC. If you know anyone that's affiliated with that organization, tell them thank you. We can't have these without our sponsors. And the folks at Enbridge, so if you know folks at Enbridge, I know some of you in the communities probably work with them uh, pretty regularly, just tell them thank you very much. So, and thank you to the Heart of Wisconsin Chamber of Commerce. You guys uh, do a lot for our community and we appreciate it. So we're a few minutes early, which I'm sure is not a problem with anybody. So thanks for being here. Have a great day. Enjoy the weather. And we will see you again sometime in the spring. Thank you very much.